Welcome to the Saddleback College Emeritus Institute Dorothy Marie Lowry Distinguished Guest Lecture Series recorded in Spring 2020. Thanks also to our faculty moderator, Mrs. Laura Hoffman. For more information regarding the Emeritus Institute, please visit our website at www.saddleback.edu forward slash emeritus. Good morning, everyone. I uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about our next speaker. Uh, we are having David Kiff, and he his talk is, Can Your City and Mine Ever Solve Homelessness? Dave Kiff has more than 25 years experience in local government, including more than 20 years in city management. He is the former city manager of Newport Beach and former interim city manager of Huntington Beach. California. He has also served as staff to the Orange County Board of Supervisors. He began his tenure as city manager in Newport Beach just as the 2009 to 2012 recession began and he helped navigate the city and community through budget reductions and service changes including contracting out services. While at the City, he worked on issues as dredging of the Newport Bay, the annexation of Newport Coast and Santa Ana Heights, and the extension of the city's noise agreement with John Wayne Airport and pension re reform. After leaving Newport, he served as interim executive director for the Association of California Cities, Orange County, where he helped start the Orange County Housing Finance Trust to help fund solutions for homelessness. He is currently affiliated with Management Partners, a professional management consulting firm specializing in helping governments improve operations. And hopefully I haven't left anything out. And I want to welcome David Kiff. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Dan. And I'm happy to be here in one of, I think, the Emeritus Program's first video uh, lectures. So we'll please forgive us if we have a couple of uh, odd noises coming in. I have a couple of dogs at home that bark at random times, but uh, we'll get through this. So as Laura mentioned, my name is Dave Kiff. I'm a retired city manager now, very recently retired. And my topic is about homelessness and with a focus on can your city and mine solve homelessness? And I will try and talk specifically about South Orange County. And then at the end, uh, Dan and Laura are gonna ask me a number of questions, probably the same ones that you'd have in, in your own views. So uh, again, Laura did a nice introduction, so I won't spend too much time on this. I've spent about 22 years in local government. I served on the Orange County Commission to End Homelessness. And spoiler alert, we did not. Homelessness is still there. The commission is still there too, working. I also worked to set up a, a housing financing vehicle for affordable and supportive housing that's a little bit less than a year old, and we're hopeful that that will um, continue to bring dollars to the solution. I wanted to start by uh, showing you about four minutes of a movie that you can watch on YouTube, and I'd highly recommend when this is over and as we're all cooped up in our homes, and hopefully for not too much longer, you watch Tony the movie. It's about 75 minutes. Um, I'm going to show just about four minutes of it. It's a pretty remarkable story of a homeless gentleman in San Diego. So I'm going to start that and I'll, and I'll interrupt it about four minutes in. Take 
across the street. It's down here that I ran into some people nine months ago that uh, prayed for me and uh, they asked me what did I want and I said I, I just want to have some meaning in my life uh, and some guidance, some direction, which, what, what, I, what can I do? And uh, the next day I ran into Dennis and he asked me do I want to get involved in this documentary to uh, help people understand homelessness and, uh, and, and that's what we did. Uh, 2007 to 2016, uh, San Diego's population of people that are living outdoors has gone up 58%, up to around 4,700 people almost. And th this is alarming growth. Not bad. Uh oh, Chola. Oh, oh. Good morning, sir. Pretty good. We try to clean up this mess. Yeah, you've been on our guest out here for a while. Uh, for how long? No. Nah. I remember seeing you here last week. Yeah. How long have you been kept out here? Uh, I don't know, a little, little bit. Okay, we've talked to you down over on, uh, yes, sir. 16th on, uh, by market, right? Yes. Uh, and do you remember what happened that day? Yeah. Yeah, we lost all our stuff. Because we've issued you multiple sites and we got a storage room today. That's what we're doing. We're packing everything, packing everything up. So, storage is going to be gone. I remember that was your story last time. We're probably going to jail today. Yes, sir. Can you for me here? Okay. Make sure you get going with all your property. Yes, sir. Continue camping out here. We'll okay. be arrested by Boston. I understand. Thank you, sir. We're on probation, so really, he said the next time he sees us, we're going to do a month in jail. There's a big confusion about what you can do and can't do, and you can stay in your tents on Saturday and Sunday, but not Monday through Friday. I don't know if that's true. That's, it's just a cat and mouse game, but we don't make the rules. They do, so just, you know, I don't know. I don't know. We just, we're just trying to survive. It's a, it's a really comes down to this. You, we need to get, we need to get rid of this stuff. And it's illegal to be home. You can see. So it's gonna be an all day affair. I guess this is it. All right. My kickstand is totally broken. That's my bike. I'll call the police. That's not your bike. That's not your bike. That is your bike. How many times does that happen? I laugh. You gotta laugh. You gotta laugh because it's ridiculous. <clears throat> you get this every day. We don't even know what size of storage we want. I'm kind of apprehensive. We have about two pallets. That's high about. This is a big one. Yeah, and this one has two doors. You think it's gonna work that size? Mm -hmm. For all your stuff. <laughs> That's kind of what I like to do is get things that are broken, fix them and something. <laughs> we'll find some co cool stuff probably. Anyways, that's what holds my card on. It's like a little kid's bike. <laughs> Hi guys. There's not many dumpsters, but the ones that are there usually have good things. A lot of recyclables or other things. Oh, and I see our first costly mistake. My wheel fell off. Always something. But um, loot, they call it loot. Stuff that you can trade or sell. And there's always a lot of that. But look at this stuff. Now, this is what I call loot. Look at this thing that people are throwing away. All these knives. It's amazing. Why would they throw away this? A grinder for coffee. Amazing. This is, look at this waffle maker. I would love to start a thrift shop. So I'm going to stop the movie there and, and move along. But again, I uh, would encourage you maybe to think about downloading from YouTube or watching on YouTube. It's called Tony the Movie, and it's about 75 minutes. So I'm going to continue. Not with Tony the movie. Um, with what I hope to cover, I'm going to give you some quick definitions. I'm going to talk about the numbers in terms of numbers of homelessness, as well as uh, costs, those kinds of numbers. 
Uh, we're going to talk about the recent past and then current events. And by recent, I mean uh, 2008 onward. Uh, some solutions, hopefully, and actions that are happening statewide. I'm also going to talk about what's certainly on all our minds lately, and that's COVID-19, um, as well as how, and how that impacts homelessness. It, it's, it's pretty critical, in fact. I'm going to give you some resources to follow up on, and then uh, Dan and Laura were going to give me some questions. So some definitions, that I, and I'm, you're going to hear uh, the, these words used in the next, uh, next several minutes. One is chronically homeless, and this is a formal definition through the Department of Housing and Development that says persons who, is basically persons who have experienced homeless at least a year or repeatedly in a repeated period of times within that year while struggling with a disabling condition. So homeless plus disabling condition means you're, you can be chronically homeless. Housing first is the next concept, and that's a concept that um, we can't get, we can't address people's underlying issues, things that may have caused them to be homeless, like sobriety or mental illness or other uh, physical health issues without putting a roof on over their heads. So the concept is get people in a house first, don't ask them to be clean before they get there. Supportive housing is the next term and that's the concept of, let's say it's me, if I were, I'd be able to live on my own in my own apartment or with a roommate or two, provided that someone checked on me to make sure I was taking my meds, I was dealing with any uh, mental health or physical health issues that I had, and someone that someone was probably on site, maybe down the hall, maybe at the bottom of the building. Um, that's the concept of supportive housing, where you're not just left alone. And then a navigation center is the fourth term, and that's a current term that people use instead of saying a homeless shelter, because it's a little bit more than a homeless sh shelter. It has so it has the beds for folks to stay while they're in transition out of homelessness. Um, plus social services right there, a way to kind of wrap around um, that person's needs. Again, whether they be uh, recovery and substance use or mental health or other social services or physical health that they need to address. So let's move to the numbers. Um, photo above is of the cleanup along the San Ana River Trail from the Voice of OC. And we all remember kind of the pictures of what the river trail looked like uh, a, a handful of years ago. So across the United States, half of all the people experiencing homelessness, and it's about half a million people, um, are in one of five states. California has the most. We have about a quarter of all homelessness in the United States, and we're currently at 151,000 people. New York, Florida, Texas, and Washington follow that. In Orange County alone, with our last point in time count, I should describe what a point in time count is, in January or February of, of usually every other year, uh, could start to happen every year now, um, people go out in the early morning hours, like four o'clock, and until about nine o'clock, they take every geographic area that's populated of Orange County, Again, they do this across the United States. And they, they will um, count how many people they, they believe are homeless. It takes multiple volunteers. Maybe some of you listening have done the volunteering for the point in time count. But um, basically you count everybody that's under in a culvert or in a car or in some other way homeless. They could be in a trailer too in a, like a Walmart parking lot. Um, the last count in 2019, there's almost 7,000 people unhoused, including um, veterans, families, almost seven, 677 seniors. Um, by Orange County region, most of the folks were in central Orange County, and I'll show you a map on the next slide of what these are, what these regions are. The next highest was North Orange County, and then um, a significantly fewer amount were in South Orange County, about 763. And when they do the point in time count, they look at uh, it, the, the term would be who is unhoused. You could be unhoused in a culvert. You could also be unhoused in a shelter because a shelter is not housing. So in Orange County, uh, or South Orange County specifically, um, about 538 of the 763 were unsheltered. 
Uh, next slide here. Uh, these are the regions. You see the South Orange County region or the, the South region includes uh, Irvine and goes all the way down to San Clemente. Of the unsheltered in Orange County, over half of them were, would make, meet that term of chronically homeless. And importantly, 73% had their last known address in Orange County. So only about a quarter from another place, at least with this study. 72% worked or currently work. We have people currently working who are homeless in Orange County, and then over half have family in Orange County. So a little bit more from that count, um, about 33%, a third had substance use issues. Um, a good chunk, 30% had a physician determined disability, and I won't go through all of these, 92% um, spent most of their homeless time in Orange County. So while they were homeless, they were here. Again, that link that people who are homeless tend to be want to be homeless in familiar places. Sorry, want to be homeless is the wrong term, but they want to be in familiar places if they have to be homeless. Um, the, the highest age cohort was people between 25 and 39 years old. In other words, uh, a th a th almost a third of the homeless were that age group. Almost 10% were seniors, 62 plus. Um, for the unsheltered, uh, about 71% are male and 28% are female. You can imagine why that might be. I think there's a there's cer there's certainly a a greater willingness, I think, on behalf of female homeless to go into a shelter as a as a more secure environment than being outside. 38% remarkably, we're homeless for the first time. That kind of shows that something happened in our economy to, to make this happen. About a fifth were, were um, sleeping in vehicles. So why do people become homeless? Um, and this is from a pretty remarkable study that uh, UCI did along with uh, United Way called the Co Homelessness in, our, in Orange County, the Cost to Our Community. Um, the top two reasons were securing or retaining jobs with wages that allowed them to afford housing. So you can see the numbers there. These numbers will add up to more than 100% because some people, people were able to cite one or more reasons. Family issues played a role, alcohol and drugs and mental health as well, and physical health. And then uh, some uh, because of uh, prison release. Uh, we're all, I think, aware of a more aggressive prison release program. Um, there are many that assert that that is involved in our the growing homelessness issues. I'm going to jump now to Orange County's housing costs because those were the top two reasons. Um, in 2017, we had a vacancy rate in Orange County of 6%. Sorry, the United States of 6%. In Orange County, it was only half that, so 3%. So the apartment and housing uh, stock in Orange County was heavily constrained by, again, a good economy. And in a good economy, you can get good, good market rents. The at the same time, the average income per month for a homeless person, this could be income from uh, various benefit programs, a veteran's benefit or a, a SSI or a disability program were, was about $938. The, yet the average rent for a one bedroom apartment was over $1,800. Now, if you are a person who is struggling to find an affordable home or affordable place to rent in Orange County, you can participate in what's called a Section 8 program. This is through the federal government's Housing and Urban Development Program. They're also called Housing Choice Vouchers. Great idea. It works, but there just aren't enough of them. Um, there's a waiting list that you can get onto, but that waiting list for the County of Orange is closed. It was last opened in 2013. The time on the waiting list, if you're there, if you're able to get to it, is about 42 months. There's only a 5% turnover. So you'd have to wait, again, 42 months at least, if you're on the list, to be able to get a voucher that would allow you to potentially get housing. Um, there's about 10,000 circulating in the county for, from the county government, about 600 are for veterans, tw uh, 210 for, for families. The average person who holds a voucher has been on it for 10 years. They've been on this program a long time. And typically if you do get a voucher, 
you'd be expected to pay about $500 of your own money or your benefit money a month. And then the voucher would pay the remainder about 1300 to the landlord. And there's a allowance for utilities as well. Uh, in Orange County, this costs the federal government and us as taxpayers about 148 million a year. So what are some of the dollar costs of homelessness, the cost to our society? This is again from the UCI United Way study. Um, <clears throat> they looked at a 12 month period and they asked cities, hospitals and non-governmental organizations what things cost. And you can see my slide here, almost $300 million a year spent to address homelessness. Most of it from cities and through law enforcement and emergency response actions. So that's police, that's emergency medical, it's ambulances. Hospitals receive part of that or end up paying part of that because they'll get the person who needs the critical care, 77 million there. Uh, the county itself about 62 million. So the average cost per homeless person in this 2014-15 study equates to $45,000 a year. And if you're one of the chronically street homeless, so remember I gave you a definition of chronically homeless, so that's what we're talking about. There is a 10% of that group, the most extreme challenging uh, folks to house and to care for, they end, up, if we could some, they end up costing almost half a million a year to care for them while they're on the streets. So that's frequent law enforcement interactions, frequent hospitalizations. So I think you and I probably look at this the same way. It's like, well, gosh, couldn't we somehow get that person housed and save that money? And, and it, it, the, the hard answer is yes. It's not an easy way to get to yes. But when a person does get housed, that same person costing about $440,000 a year, when they're housed, this study showed it would cost about $55,000. And you can see the rest of that. Um, you, you can see if you're chronically homeless just in your health services costs, it drops from 98,000 down to 43,000. If you're just the average homeless, the number is still about a half, a half uh, or 50% savings. So we, this study showed that in as far back as 2014, 15, we could save, our, the county region could save about $42 million a year if we could just address all those who are chronically homeless and place them in supportive housing. They also said we'd have 78 fewer ambulance transport and potentially up to 100%, and it's hard to believe, that's what the study said, fewer arrests among those who are formerly homeless. So how did we get here? How did we get to this problem? I'm gonna look at the period of 2008 until 2012. So, and I, I need to kind of remind you at least how cities work. Cities work based on a certain amount of revenue sources, property taxes, sales taxes, when you buy a product or have a meal, when we used to go out for meals, in, um, uh, in, at a restaurant in your town, hotel bed taxes is a big one for many communities. The communities that I worked in, it was a big deal. Uh, fees for processing things. And then uh, sometimes there's developer fees and community facilities districts that, that support a city or support activities. The expenditures, the primary ones are police, fire, parks, libraries, local infrastructure, so streets, roads, sewers, water pipes, and then kind of the admin part of things. Notice on there, housing is not here. Cities do not typically set aside money for housing. And, the, uh, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So in 2008, 2009, uh, revenues for cities dramatically fell. Some, in some places, they stayed the same instead of growing along with the costs. But in many places, things just collapsed. And expenses increased at the same time because expenses were still on that, are always on that trajectory of slight increases. And, but particularly for pension costs, they, they went through the roof. And that's because of the collapse in the equities market collapsed the CalPERS, Public Employee Retirement System, pension fund, which is, bait, which is invested just like everyone's 401ks are. So when, when those, those expenses in, sorry, when the equities fell, CalPERS goes to cities and said, okay, you need to pay more to put more money in the bank because we lost money. 
and there's sure this isn't a subject about this isn't a lecture on pensions but i know all of that is quite controversial so thinking about cities and housing i'm going to talk about governor brown i'm going to say good things and concerning things um, there's a concept in call in california and in many states but especially california called redevelopment it started way back in the 1940s and it ended in february of of 2012, remember that day, remember that year. Uh, about 430 of these agencies that were, that were under umbrella cities had to dissolve after February of 2012. They once provided about a billion dollars a year to cities that had to be used for affordable housing for low and very low and moderate income uh, people. So that's a billion dollars that all of a sudden stopped. The reason Governor Brown did this, I'm not trying to be overly critical, is that it's, he, he was seeking more money for schools and redevelopment tends to take property taxes away from schools. And the state then has to pitch in the difference. So uh, Governor Brown's goal was good and that was to get more money to schools, but it ended up taking a billion dollars away from cities used for housing. So I'm gonna jump now from to 2013 and into about 2017, 2018. The economic times, as we all know, were improving, but for cities, the pension costs kept rising because of that fall was so big, and it ends up kind of constraining budgets and crowding out services. At the same time, out in the private sector, you know, things are going pretty gangbusters. Market rate housing costs uh, jump um, about 38% during that five-year period, but yet wages and salaries jump less. They jump about 15 to 21%. So one result of that difference, we saw it all in, throughout the county, certainly in central Orange County, one result was more homeless and more homeless encampments. And the encampment by the Santa Ana River, I think is the most uh, noteworthy, the one that people remember the most. And that's my picture, uh, on the one side of the screen. The other side is the picture of the Plaza of the Flags. And this is in downtown Santa Ana. When the river was cleared, a lot of people moved to the Plaza of the Flags. And this is kind of what we're seeing in our central Orange County cities. So Judge David Carter, that's a name you probably remember. And Judge Carter's, I don't wanna, he, he's, he's alive and well. I'm not saying he's not here anymore, but he stepped in at this point. He was concerned about the inhumane conditions um, he directed the clearance of the riverbed encampments, and he did this uh, in a way that um, threatened, uh, threatens a strong word, um, cities and counties by revoking their ability to enforce anti, any anti-camping laws that they may have on the books. An anti-camping law says that you and I cannot pitch a tent and set up a little home in a on a public space or in a public facility. And Judge Carter said, unless you take care of these homeless needs, which are camps, I'm not gonna let any city enforce their anti-camping laws. And I'm generalizing here, but that's, that's kind of the, the guidance that the judge was giving. And it was an initial window to a case I'm gonna talk about next called Martin versus Boise. But Judge Carter um, really pulled every, every together. He was very strong and aggressive in, in to, to city and county leaders. He gr uh, group us all into his courtroom um, early on uh, weekday mornings and say, what are you doing to solve this problem? And that ended up in settlement discussions between key cities like Orange, Fullerton, Costa Mesa, and a handful of others and the Orange County Catholic Worker, which sued on behalf of a number of homeless people to draw to the, the settlement caused the expansion of shelters and the additional expenditure of funds to get make sure that those people once living in the encampments had housing. So um, a lot of commitments came out of Judge Carter's efforts. They're still coming out of Judge Carter's efforts, but he really did, I think, bring a new focus from, to pub, from public agencies on this issue. So Martin versus City of Boise, this is happening shortly after Judge Carter steps in. And in, this involves uh, a homeless person in Boise, Idaho, 
who challenged the, the fact that Boise was telling the, the person, Martin, to um, remove a tent and remove a camp, an encampment uh, because, and the, the, Martin as a plaintiff argued that, you can't, that that's cruel and unusual punishment to upset my living arrangement when I have no other choices and, um, and not give me a place to move to. So Martin versus Boise end up saying that cities cannot enforce anti-camping laws without having a bed to move people to. Now, importantly, if I'm the homeless person and my encampment's being taken down, but the city says, hey, Dave, you got a bed over here. Uh, you got to move to that. I can reject the bed. I can say, nope, you know what? I don't want to be in a shelter. And at that point, my encampment can still be cleared. I have to, uh, I have to at least be offered the bed though. So that was September of 2018. And cities across California, across the Ninth Circuit, <clears throat> we're all very concerned about this. And you can kind of imagine why, uh, because we don't have enough beds for everybody. Um, a number of cities uh, brought this to the Supreme Court on review. The Supreme Court in December of 2019 rejected the review. So the case Martin versus Boise stands. Anti-camping laws <clears throat> are not able to be enforced without having beds offered to that person. And that case stands now in all nine states in the West, including California. So I'm gonna jump back to Governor Brown about this same time. He's seeing the problem that we're all seeing in real time. Um, he and the legislature propose a new tax uh, that passes and we're, we're paying it today. You, you pay it if you sell your home. It's called a documentary transfer tax. It's uh, about $75 to 225 per home that's sold. It's supposed to raise about $300 million a year and then it's split between the local governments like cities and the state government, 70-30. He also put a $4 billion measure on the no, what was the November 18 ballot. It passed. So the tax is in place, the ballot measure passed. Even after all that occurred, uh, Governor Brown said, um, he still struggles with the fact that we can solve this, so we can resolve housing affordability unless there is a cool down in the market, which is kind of an interesting thing to talk about as we sit here today. So let's move to last year and today. Um, just a reminder again about the current numbers from this source is the Orange County Community Indicators Report. Just to maintain housing in Orange County, if you have a job, you need to earn at least $31 per hour right now. So think of who that leaves out. It leaves out a lot of the working class folks that are in and around Orange County. It doesn't mean you can't double up on housing, you can, but just to survive on housing, you need $31 an hour wages. And the cost of living in Orange County is 91% higher than the national average. So knowing that, knowing what we do, we know about the cost of living and what, you, what happened to redevelopment. Um, my slide here is redevelopment math. We used to have a billion dollars a year for affordable housing and that ended in 2012. And now we have 300 million a year for affordable housing. And that just started last year. And that's my unhappy face just because there's $700 million that are not going into affordable housing anymore that once were. And then that's kind of when, when I look to why homelessness has gotten bad, this is certainly one reason. So what about the solutions? Let's talk about where we can go from here. I'm gonna play another, uh, this, this one's a short NBC News clip. In this country, the state of Utah made headlines this past week after doing something dozens of other states have been unable to do. After a decade-long initiative, chronic homelessness in Utah has now dropped to an unprecedented low. As NBC's Jacob Rascone reports, the solution was surprisingly simple. For Susie Wright, there really is no place like home because for six years, she didn't have one. Living on the streets is not... A place where you want to have your kids. Susie and her two sons, DJ and Brian, shuttled between a homeless shelter, a van, and living with friends. I didn't feel good about myself at all. 
And then the state of Utah gave her an offer she couldn't afford to refuse. The same offer being given to every chronically homeless person in the state, a home. We call it housing first, employment second. Even the state's homeless task force director, Lloyd Pendleton, was skeptical at first. I said, you guys must be smoking something. This is totally unrealistic. But the results are difficult to dispute. In 2005, Utah had nearly 2,000 chronically homeless persons. A study released this week says there are now only 178, an unprecedented 91% drop statewide. It's a very simple solution to a very complex issue. You put them in housing first, then help them begin to deal with the issues that cause them to become homeless. U.S. Army veteran Don Williams lived in a bush for nearly 10 years. When they told you that they were going to give you a home, what did you do? A jump for joy. <laughs> <laughs> but they say... You'll incentivize laziness. Yes, getting your hand out. They also need to pay rent, 30% of their income or $50, whichever is greater. And Pendleton says the program actually saves money in the long run. It costs an average of $20,000 to take care of a chronically homeless person living on the streets, but only about $8,000 a year to house and provide a caseworker for that same person. Uh, I call them homeless citizens. They're part of our citizenry. They're not damn enough. That's we. It's an approach that Susie says has changed her life. She now works as a cleaning supervisor at her apartment complex. Homelessness hasn't disappeared in the Beehive State, but may be on its way. These are from DJ school. That's what a home means, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. A place to put your son's drawings. Yeah. <laughs> one home, one family at a time. Good. Jacob Rescone, NBC News, Salt Lake City, Utah. NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. In this country, the state. So um, yeah, that was Utah, and that was 2015, and that, that was a nice news story. And what I summarize from that, or what I my takeaway from that, is that um, housing first works, <clears throat> supportive housing works. But you you could see too in that uh, news clip, the costs in Utah are completely different from the costs in Orange County, especially South Orange County. There we're. we're we're talking about doubling or tripling not only the cost savings, but the cost uh, of housing and the cost solutions. And uh, because nothing is ever perfect, I needed to share with you this news clip. Uh, sorry, this, this is from a Reuters story, and the date is 2019. And they're saying even after 2015, once a national model, Utah struggles with homelessness. So they're seeing that um, the problem is a bit overwhelming even when you try to provide enough housing. The key is they're, not, they're finding they're not able to provide enough either and they're not able to provide enough funding to provide the, the amount of housing units they need. So that's, I'm sorry that part of my theme is there's good news and then everything isn't always as great as it looks, but we gotta keep trying. So let's talk about Governor Newsom, where um, he's been uh, elected, and he focused in his February of 2020 State of the Union entirely on homeless homelessness, um, and that was to, and these are kind of the some of the things he's introduced: uh, 1.4 billion for rental subsidies and affordable housing, the distribution of FEMA facilities, FEMA tents and trailers to communities. And uh, the community that I now live in um, had a number of those, I'll show you that picture. He also said that 286 state-owned properties like fairgrounds and vacant lots should be made available to local governments for free. And some of those are in Orange County. Um, he called for the legislature to continue to reduce environmental review that gets in the way of affordable housing. And then his, in his comment on all this was, I very much respect local control, the ability of cities to do what they need, but not at the cost of creating a two-class California. So here are some of those state-owned lands. I keep moving my uh, video screen away. Uh, none of them are in South Orange County, but they are places like um, Fairview Developmental Center in Costa Mesa, the Orange County Fairgrounds is not on this specific list, but it's a part of the discussion. And then you see they go all the way up through to, to Fullerton. A lot of these are Caltrans owned properties. This is what the FEMA trailers look like. Uh, they arrived in uh, Sonoma County um, 
to help clear out an encampment and they're now being used as al an alternative to an encampment. So this is a directly as a part of Governor Newsom's actions. So let's talk about supportive housing as a solution. Um, and Orange County is headquarters to um, a really tremendous company that provides supportive housing. They're called Jamboree Housing and uh, they don't pay me to say things like this. They, <clears throat> I'm just a fan. Um, they are the, um, the, among the five largest developers of affordable housing in the nation. And I can almost guarantee you that you would drive by their properties, the, the things that they build, and you would not know that that is affordable housing, not know that it's supportive housing for chronically homeless. And you'd say, you know what, I would not mind at all that this would be a neighbor in a properly zoned neighborhood. So they have about 14 different housing, uh, they have these housing programs about 14 different cities, <clears throat> including Mission Viejo and San Clemente. Um, a lot of them are in Anaheim, Fullerton, uh, Garden Grove. And the photos here show uh, Veterans Village, and that's the one on the bottom. That's a, I, I think it, it's, it's, pretty, it's slated to be opened uh, very soon here. It's 75 units just for formerly chronically homeless veterans. And the one above is uh, Rockwood in Anaheim that's for families. And that one is up and operating. There's another uh, discussion going around that I, I think is a good solution, and that's called YIGBY. You've heard of NIMBY, like not in my backyard, and you've heard of, I think, YIMBY, which is yes in my backyard. Well, this is YIGBY. This is yes in God's backyard. And this is, um, there's a, a number of stories about some San Diego focus on this. This is Claremont Lutheran in San Diego. And what they said is, we have a church, we have a congregation, we have a big parking lot, and our congregation cares about homelessness and wants to help as a part of their faith mission. So they said, let's see about what on our property, our own property, we could do to help build affordable housing. So um, they are actively pursuing the permitting and construction for upwards of uh, 24 apartments for the formerly homeless on their own lots. And the Yigby movement in San Diego has tried to identify other religious uh, facilities that are willing and able to do this. So I think uh, that's been a really intriguing solution on the housing front. Now, Los Angeles is another great case study of where things are uh, moving along, not necessarily successfully, because it's, it's a bumpy road. Uh, the voters of Los Angeles passed Measure HHH back in November of 16, that was a uh, a bond, 1.2 billion just in the region for housing, for supportive housing, the kind that, uh, again, Jamboree does. Uh, they also passed more recently a, a Measure H, which is a sales tax increase for ongoing revenue just for homeless supportive services. Now, um, this is another fun thing for you to uh, take away and, and go and read, hopefully, and that is the Los Angeles Times um, did a, a series of articles uh, within the last six months about homelessness. And one of the remarkable one, ones is a, a program called Encampment to Home. And their concept was, let's take an entire block of an encampment where people have built relationships, uh, familial relationships between their campmates, the person in the next tent, they look out for each other, they join each other for meals. Let's pick up that whole encampment and put it into a floor of an affordable housing uh, development. And again, just the theme of, of my talk, good things and bad things, some of them made it. Some of them did great and are doing great in the, in the supportive housing concept. Others were just not able to handle it and did not stay in the housing, violated the rules, and out they went again. But it's a, it's a great human interest story. And look, so look for Encampment to Home again with the LA Times series. One of the most exciting things that I think is happening in Orange County is a group called Be Well OC. They're uh, private and public mental health and other professionals, they're hospitals, um, <clears throat> county, the County of Orange and others working on the mental health side of things. 
one of the most frustrating things for uh, me as a city manager and for law enforcement was, you know, we've got somebody who's acting out and acting badly in the middle of a street or in front of a restaurant and screaming and yelling and threatening people. What do we do? That person is not ready for a shelter, but they are ready to be uh, 4150, taken in and, and uh, stabilized, check their meds, make sure they have meds in the first place and they're properly diagnosed. So um, Be Well Orange County uh, broke ground on a campus in Orange. It's about 60,000 square feet, $40 million. This is the city of Orange by Theo Lacey Jail. And that's the whole concept is you would be able to serve as an acute site to take someone who needs care right away but is not eligible for care in a shelter because of their condition and that they can be treated and put on the path to success. Be Well has a concept of opening two more of these. Um, this one here in Orange should open in the fall of 2020 and it's all modeled after an effort in San Antonio called the Restoration Center. So other mental health uh, areas of progress, the county and various cities have been working with um, ho local hospitals to say that, um, and this is all kind of ironic now, they used to have ICU beds that were available. Hopefully they will again shortly, but um, certainly not for the next couple of months. Um, that College, Hosp College Avenue Hospital in Costa Mesa and Garden Grove and Huntington Beach hospitals in those two cities would serve as small little mental health treatment areas where someone could be stabilized, <clears throat> get their mental health or their substance use issues addressed for 72 hours or a week and then transition into shelter. And again, from a city perspective, this is a tremendous benefit because we really get those, those high levels of acting out chronically homeless off the street and onto something better. The other th exciting thing that's happening is job training and retraining. Uh, Chrysalis is a, is a nonprofit that works in Anaheim. They work all throughout LA and Orange County, doing some tremendous things about training the homeless for new, new jobs and new skills. Orange County United Way does the same thing with a concept called Upskill OC. Uh, some tremendous ideas going on there. So, at the same time all this is happening, uh, the state is putting its thumb on the scale, some would say in a good way, some would say in a concerning way, about um, housing. And everyone in Orange County should be aware of this if you're not already. Um, and this, is, uh, this clip is from the LA Daily News just earlier this month. And it talks about this concept called um, RENA, Regional Housing Needs Assessment or Regional Housing Needs Allocation. And basically, that's the, the state is trying to make sure that localities approve enough locations for up to 1.3 million more housing units in the Southland, in, Southern, in, in the SCAG area, Southern California Association of Governments, that includes Orange County, based on this, this state law requirement. So a regional housing needs assessment is the state's way of ensuring that cities site housing, site places for housing. I notice I'm not saying build housing, it's about siting housing, making sites available for all ranges of housing from low and very low income folks to market rate. And for uh, a number of places in Orange County, a number of cities in Orange County, including some that I wor once worked with, the, the RENA allocations tripled in some cases from just five years ago. I'm going to keep talking a little bit more about RENA here. Um, here's some of the numbers for South Orange County that were that are in this um, the state and the SCAG approved amounts. You could see uh, Liso with 1,100 new units, Laguna Hills 1,900 new units, um, Laguna Woods about 1,000 new units, Lake Forest 3,200, Mission Viejo 2,200. Um, the communities I work for, Huntington Beach has 13. A, a new RENA number of 13,000. And you can imagine how concerning that is to city leaders, just even if they have compassion and want to build more housing, it's just trying to find enough sites for that. You really end up having to go up and then up, I mean, physically in, in larger buildings 
And then people, the, your longtime residents, even your new residents start to complain about traffic and who's going to pay law enforcement costs and emergency medical costs and all those things. So um, it, it's certainly a tough nut to crack. The other thing that it has been discussed in the legislature um, is this concept that's in, uh, placed in Senate Bill 50. Now, Senate Bill 50 is now uh, dead for the year. It did not get out of the legislature, but it, it probably will keep coming back. And it was uh, a very contentious bill. And basically it said that um, if, you're, if you're a developer who wants to build housing, in uh, places adjacent to transit, so so think a major bus line, a major rail line, you it should be easier for you to build those homes. You should not have to go through the same hoops that the local government puts you through. So um, so part of this discussion would involve allowing for a height limit that maybe your local government doesn't allow for. You have, the local government says, no, buildings can't be over 25 feet. Well, the state law would supersede that and say, no, they can be 45 in this area. So you can imagine how your local elected officials were upset at the concepts behind Senate Bill 50, but um, it came very close to passage. It's, it's a big interest of many in the legislature from both parties, both the Republicans and Democrats, but both parties opposed it too. So it's something certainly to follow. The California Senate leader, I have the bullet point there, said, you know, SB 50 may have died here, uh, but it's coming back because the status quo can't stand. So about that question, what does solving homelessness take? It certainly takes a community awareness on, on all of our parts about the laws and regulations. Martin versus Boise and Rena. So I get my plea to you as you're listening to me is when you yell at your local government and say, why is that encampment there? Why, they, they know that the, the, strict, the strictures that they're, they're trying to live within, that they need to have a place to take people. And um, Southern Orange County especially is challenged with the amount of plate beds that it has available. It has some, but it, it could use more in order to accomplish, to, to potentially house all those six, 763 or so people. Um, the, other, the other thing that solving homelessness takes is that concept of more housing of all levels, because you got to move people through the system, as well as more supportive housing. Uh, building a shelter does not, it puts a roof over someone's head, but it doesn't give that person housing. It's not the be all end all. And then funding, big deal. I mentioned how uh, redevelopment money went away. Section eight is always constrained from the federal government. So it needs, we need more Section 8 funds. We need consistent state revenues. The other thing the federal government does, which is important, is offering tax credits to affordable housing developers that helps them package a, um, an affordable housing project in a market rate environment. You can imagine how expensive it is to build any kind of housing. If all of a sudden going in, you're going to say, we're only going to charge this much rent to the people to help pay that mortgage. So you need tax credits and other things to help you fill that gap. Um, solving homelessness takes supporters. If this is something that you're inclined to say, hey, I'd love to solve this problem and it's part of either your faith mission or your personal mission, whatever is important to you, it does need people like that. It needs people to advocate for housing, more housing, more supportive housing in the right places. I stress that it is in the right places. Um, not all communities can, can accept a shelter. Not all spots in a community can accept supportive housing, but many places can. Needs regional mental health solutions. We talked about OC, OC, B, uh, Be Well OC. Needs jobs and retraining. And I guess the, the thing I, I try to leave people with, it does take some compassion and understanding, knowing um, that those are those are people who, they may not have been us, but they may have been a lot like us and something, something went wrong in their life. Um, medical problem, medical bills, substance use, mental illness, and it's that, that thought that they're, but for the grace of God go I, I think is an important one to think about here. 
Uh, let's talk about COVID-19 uh, briefly. Uh, this is important. It's important to homelessness, as, just as it's important to us. Um, some great articles online if you want to take a peek about how COVID-19 affects the homeless. Um, it's very challenging. Uh, homeless are among the highest risk among, among us. You can imagine those things they talk about, the coronavirus. Hey, older people and people with underlying health conditions. Well, that's a lot of homeless folks. Um, so what the governor and localities are trying to do is where people are unsheltered, get them extra tents and bedding to allow them to socially distance at least their sleeping arrangement and their living arrangement. Even where sheltered, um, it's critical to reduce the shelter occupancy. You can imagine that six months ago, beds in a shelter were three feet away from each other. You can't do that right now. So you need to reduce the capacity of the shelter or get more square footage, both of which are very challenging. And so they're, they're so challenging that it's getting kind of silly. They're, it, I, silly is the wrong word. Um, but they're saying, you know, for what we have, people should be sleeping head to foot, not head to head, in order to hopefully just create a little bit more distance just in breathing. Some communities are looking at commandeering empty hotel rooms. There's not a lot of people staying in hotels right now. So uh, 30,000 rooms available just in San Francisco alone. And the, so there's limited success here, though. I, the last time I read, which was just shortly earlier this week, we're at the, you know, we're in the last week of March, only one uh, 240 room in Pomona was willing to do this. And the governor uh, released about $150 million in emergency funding just to accomplish some of these steps. And um, the scary part of COVID-19 is for local governments, I think it gets worse um, because there's another impact to homelessness to, that COVID brings to local governments that we don't talk about so much. And that's the fiscal situation that our local governments will be faced with when um, revenues decline so dramatically with this, um, with this downturn. And you can imagine some sources of revenues will either maintain or kind of come back. People will be going back to Costco and buying appliances. People will still pay their property taxes. But um, they will not be, the, there's so many nights missed at restaurants and bars and in hotel rooms that those communities that rely on um, one-time events based on the day, that, that restaurant visit, that bar visit, that's lost money now. And uh, a number of cities are gonna see real significant hits from this storm. Um, so again, local governments will be stretched to provide basic services, just like in the, in the Great Recession. And we talked, about, I, we talked about documentary transfer taxes. If people aren't selling properties as much, that three, 300 million goes down to much less than that potentially. So that was an ongoing revenue stream for housing and homelessness that's going to be less. And then uh, lastly, local governments are going to be less willing to add housing because housing doesn't really pay for itself on its own in terms of tax revenue. So um, you're not going to be as likely to build a six, to allow to be built a 60 unit apartment building when you know that's going to involve service costs, police, fire, parks, and that's not paid for. In fact, it's, it's even more constrained now than it was a month ago. So all those things, I think, create a really, make me really worried about the coronavirus's impact on homelessness and on local governments and on those two together. So some resources to look at. <clears throat> um, County of Orange has some good sites. Uh, I'll, I'll pause here just if you want to kind of take some things down. Um, the Yigby site is on there for San Diego. Be Well Orange County is always looking for uh, fans and friends. United to End Homelessness, United Way's site is tremendous. And then the National Alliance to End Homelessness has some great information. So with that, um, Dan and Laura, I certainly welcome your questions here. Dave, thank you so much. Very welcome. Um, we do have a, a couple questions, and I appreciate uh, giving us the chance to represent our students. Um, 
first of all, many of us who drive, you know, we'll see a, an individual just uh, standing on the street corner. And perhaps that feels, I know for me, that feels hopeless somewhat. I'm not knowing how to help that one person in general, but also as they exemplify a regional problem. Um, and so, you know, we may drive past without helping and we may just try to put that uncomfortable situation out of our mind. What would you suggest, um, even in terms of those kind of one-off scenarios, uh, how do we as a community help that person who may be just standing on the street corner? So uh, it, it kind of depends on um, the, the situation, obvious. Uh, uh, what, what I, I'll, I'll just tell you how I deal with that. I, I am very reluctant to give people money who are standing in the middle of an intersection or at a stoplight with a sign um, because I, I think um, it, A, it's unsafe for that person to be there and that person is putting themselves and others at risk. Um, B, um, some people can collect a lot of money that way. A couple of, of our police department uh, had mentioned to me that some folks were getting upwards of $200 a day that way. I just don't think that's a healthy behavior to reinforce. So um, the, the, if you, most police departments and the sheriff's uh, department in South Orange County have homeless liaison officers. What I would encourage you to do is if you saw someone there repeatedly, um, point that out to your, the sheriff's department and the homeless liaison to say, can you do some intervention with this person? And that, that liaison can make sure they're aware, the homeless person is aware of what services and what, what resources are available to that individual. And oftentimes they are aware of everything they just are making more money. Again, this sounds very cynical. I apologize. Making more money standing in the intersection. Hmm. So, um, so that, that's one case. Let, let's say you, you said, you know what? I really want to do something. If you felt comfortable with your own personal safety and you wanted to say, you know what? I'm going to swing over to that Carl's Jr. or that Subway and I'm going to buy you a sandwich. Um, I, think, I think that's a helpful gesture uh, to make sure that someone is able to get a meal. So it kind of depends on your personal security level and, and what you're comfortable with, but that, that would be my guidance. Thanks. A, a question that I have on my mind and maybe some other people, um, sometimes I think people who are homeless don't want shelter. They seem to like living independently and not wanting to follow any rules. Um, are we engaged in something futile in those cases of people who insist on living on their own and resisting any help? Um, I, that's certainly something that I think about a lot and that I, I, I can have that perception sometimes too. Well, that person is just, they're a loner. They're not going to be want to want to be in a housed environment. Um, when I talk to, people who are closer to the homelessness issue than I am, longtime advocates, homeless liaison officers, they all say, Dave, you're wrong, that everybody is able to and ultimately wants, when they're in a better frame of mind, housing. Nobody is enjoying life on the streets. And I know hmm. that's hard for me to believe too, because I'd say, no, I'm, I'm sure that person does not want to move into housing. So, um, the homeless liaison officers typically will will let's let's take that person that's highly reluctant to go into housing. They'll they'll spend a lot of time with them, uh, upwards of months on day to day interactions to start to build trust, to importantly address their mental health issue, issues, oftentimes or their physical health issue, and then once that person is more stabilized in terms of whatever it is that's keeping them out of housing, whether it's a paranoia or a fear. Um, that they and they have housing available, which is a big if. They're able to successfully house even those uh, those people. Hmm. Um, so I, one question that com has come up right now um, 
you know, some of our, some of our community spaces like, yeah, like parks or the Santa Ana river bed or those places aren't necessarily meant for encampments. Um, so why, why aren't they just removed? Uh, they clearly are not meant for encampments. That's absolutely right. Uh, parks were built for a reason. It's transitory. It's um, you, you and I, all of us in this room and all of us watching, we would not be allowed to set something up in a park or in a library and, and do this. <clears throat> so um, I'm, a, I'm a, uh, I have always been a firm believer in anti-camping laws, but with Martin versus Boise, um, all of the, the cities that have to deal with this have to at least provide an option. That's the law of the land right now, that you need to have beds available. Again, as we talked about, I can re if I'm the homeless person, I can reject the bed, but I, I better, then I, then I can, my stuff will be picked up and I'll be said, Dave, you know, move along. You cannot stay here anymore. So where you still see that, where the folks in the audience still see encampments, um, A, I'd suspect that your local government is working on trying to get that person into housing. And B, if, if they can't do that, that means there aren't beds available, which is why we all should gently encourage our local officials to make sure more beds are available. Hmm. Yeah, in regards to that, um, as to building more housing, uh, does it, it doesn't seem like we have the room in Orange County and South Orange County uh, where our communities are, are really built out. Uh, where would we put millions of homes? I, I certainly think that's true in, in many regions, including South Orange County. And as, as uh, folks who live in South Orange County know, there's a, th these are planned communities. There's, a, there's areas of single family residences and there's areas of duplexes and, and larger buildings, but it's all laid out. It's been laid out since the, what, the 60s and 70s, in some cases earlier than that. Um, but the state says, okay, we get that, but uh, you, you cities should still be looking at what might be available. Is there, you know, I, I point to the example of people are, people are working differently now. They're certainly working differently in the last three weeks because of the coronavirus, but even the last couple of years, more people are working from home. Um, more people are, uh, have, have a different office situation. So do we really need as many commercial properties? I, I would often point to, you, you, can, you guys, everyone can drive into the Santa Ana region up the five and the 55 and you see all these just blocks and blocks of two story uh, commercial office buildings. Almost all of them have big for lease signs on them. So there is a vacancy issue right there. So shouldn't we be, should we be looking at those kinds of properties and move those from commercial office into housing? And I think the answer is yes, it just kind of depends on where. And then the second area that, I, that people are looking at more and more are shopping centers. And I, we see this in South Orange County, I think, with the old Laguna Hills Mall. The concept is bringing housing into a retail and entertainment environment, not having them separate anymore, which I think is brilliant for the survival of the mall. Um, and to me, those are also opportunities to add housing in an area where it may be more suitable. Um, Laguna Hills isn't the only city looking at that. The main place in Santa Ana, there's a significant redevelopment plan there, which does the same thing, brings in hundreds and hundreds of housing units to a mall that's really struggling without that. Uh, Dave, final question here. Um, there's, within homelessness, uh, there seems to be a sense of classism of, well, I am, I've been able to get a house or I can afford my rent, even if I'm on a fixed income and that person for whatever reason can't. And so there is this sense of entitlement or betterment. Um, and that then goes back to kind of that NIMBY focus of not in my backyard. And even as we talk about housing, moving into the Laguna Hills mall area, there's this sense of, well, yeah, but they, 
they don't make as much or they shouldn't be able to live here because that is just affordable housing as if something like affordable housing is bad. So I wanted to just ask a little bit about how would you suggest we as a community um, find that compassion for each other, kind of leveling the playing field of people should, in, at least in my perspective, have the ability to have affordable housing into which they can move or at least have that as an option. So could you talk a little bit more about how we can counteract that, that NIMBY focus and, and perhaps develop it, develop a little bit more sense of compassion? Yeah, and I, I think I do that in two ways. One, I, I love to point at examples of successful affordable housing projects because uh, whatever image people have, I don't think it's the image of the Jamboree product that mm -hmm. that's uh, th throughout Irvine and Anaheim and Mission Viejo and not throughout, but it, it's it's out there and it's it's a really great product. It's well run. I think it's better run than any apartment project, especially when you have when you have services on site because um, th those those managers, those apartment managers, are not passive managers of the people living in their units. So I, I think it is great to point to examples of where this goes well. If someone still says, no, I, I don't have that kind of level of compassion or understanding, I get that. But mm -hmm. and here, then here's what I point to. Um, and it's happening in the community that I live in now. Um, I went into the CVS store um, late, later in an evening to fill a prescription. And the only person in the building was one cashier and the pharmacist. And there was a line of probably eight or nine people, all not in all, some level of coughing. Again, this is pre-coronavirus, so I wasn't quite so paranoid. But mm -hmm. the pharmacist said, "You know what? We just we can't. We're we're in an expensive area here, and we cannot have workers live anywhere near here. I can't hire people because they're got they got to live two hours away. So I think people need to ask themselves um, in our in our service economy, firefighters, police officers, teachers, people who work at Home Depot, people who work at Trader Joe's, uh, people who work at CVS, isn't it important that they live somewhere proximate to their work? Not only for their own well being, but so we can get service that we expect and like, and for their families, that a, a, a mom or a dad shouldn't be driving two hours each way to get to work mm. that doesn't pay very much in the first place. So I think our society is better when we have housing for all levels of, of worker income. Great. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate you being with us today and for your insights. And uh, I hope that for our students, um, this will spark some helpful dialogue. And I know it, for me, at least it brings uh, a new level of understanding of what's going on down here. So thank you for your time today. You're very welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. I, um, I guess the last, if I can ask one last question. Oh, sure. How can we get more involved? Or should we refer to that one slide that you put up? Um, I, I would refer to the slide a little bit. I, to me, um, the best answer is always local. If you if you felt like this was an issue that you were passionate about, it's a great thing just to talk to your elected officials about it, um, your whatever community you live in, your city council members. I know in South Orange County, we just have some wonderful council members, and um, they are they are struggling with this just like everybody else. They're challenged by it, and if just sometimes just a kind word to say, mm -hmm. you know what, I'd like to, I, I like the fact that you're trying to solve this with us um, goes such a long way. Um, if you're involved in a church um, or another non, non governmental organization, those are great places to do good local work. So uh, in addition to the ones I put on the website. All right. Well, thank you so much, David. Really appreciate your talk. You're very welcome.